Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I had prepared really carefully with Annie and John this story. Thank you. <laughs> you can sit now if you want, yeah. And I'd practiced it, and I timed it, and I felt really good about it. And then this morning, I woke up at, at 2.30 in the morning and went back to sleep a little bit, and then I went at 5.30 to the Mississippi River, which I do every day, and when I was there, it was clear, no, that story's not what I'm going to do. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Annie and John. <laughs> Hopefully, there'll be parts of it. Um, but what I mostly want to do is trust the power of your listening to draw out what's most important. And I believe in prayer, and I ask several people to pray for specific people, some for me, some for Dr. Trusheim. I didn't tell you about that. <laughs> Some for Annie, some for John, some for all of us. Um, and I trust that will guide us where we need to go to. So who knows what's going to happen in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> to start with, I want to ask you um, a couple questions to start thinking about. And there should be on your table in front of you a yellow card that has two questions. On one side is the question, what healing have you experienced or witnessed? And the other side is, what healing do you long for? And by that, I mean any kind of healing, physical, emotional, relational, political. So what I'd ask you to do, just as we're getting started, you won't need to show this to anyone, but just take a, take a minute Ponder those two questions. You could write a couple notes in there. They don't have to be legible. But I just want to have that as a reference point for later on in the morning. So just think for yourselves a minute. What, what healing have you experienced? And what healing do you long for? I'm speaking today as a guinea pig. Um, I'm speaking as a, a subject of an experiment that's in progress. I see it like a clinical trial in healing stories that I prescribed myself. And even though I prescribed it myself, I have many teachers and healers in that clinical trial that I want to tell you some stories about. Because I want the very best medical treatment that's possible. And I have a diagnosis that medical treatment doesn't offer much promise for. It doesn't offer a cure. It doesn't even promise a long life. So I need more than that. So my hypothesis in this self-prescribed clinical trial of healing stories is that if we openly and honestly tell stories about what is wounded and broken in us, and along with that, tell stories of what is healing and moving to wholeness in us, and if we do that in loving community, that will move us towards healing emotionally, physically, and relationally. And I see that practice of healing stories as a, as a practice, like exercise or meditation, that contributes to our health, not in a magical way, but in a contribute through practice way. And, um, I believe pre uh, preliminary, oftentimes preliminary, preliminary findings from clinical trials can be very important. I was a part of a clinical trial that Dr. Trusheim helped me do that ended up closing because, in my understanding, many of the people on the trial died. And that was an important preliminary finding. 
So I want to report some of my preliminary findings today in this experiment with healing stories. And the umbrella, the title of my uh, preliminary findings is that there is a healing river coming for all of us and it's unavoidable. So I want to tell you some stories about my experience in this trial. And I want to start by telling you about Dr. Peter Lund, who is sitting right in front of me. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter um, is a neighbor. He lives around the corner from me and my family. And up until two and a half years ago, I would say we were acquaintances. Um, we'd had dinner, our families had dinner together a couple times, um, hadn't talked too much. And we've got kids about the same age. Um, and I started having these intense headaches for the first time. I was 44 years old, mostly perfectly healthy all those 44 years. I started having these intense headaches. I went to a couple doctors. One said, probably sinus infection. The other one said, probably migraines. But they continued and they got stronger. And so my wife and I, we talked to Peter, We're asking for help. What, what, where can we go? What should we do? Um, and it turns out Peter's a frickin' angel <laughs> <laughs> with a heart bigger than oceans. And he's been uh, dramatically helpful to me over the last two and a half years. So Peter suggested that we go to a neurologist. And that neurologist said, well, we're going to do an MRI just to rule things out. He said, I don't think we'll find anything, but we just need to rule things out. And two days after that, my amazing wife Jenny and I were sitting in a neurosurgeon's office, Dr. Naguib, who I'm also very grateful for. And Dr. Naguib, as some of you know Dr. Naguib, he's He's quite a blunt, direct guy in ways I appreciate. So we're meeting him for the first time. We're sitting in his office. He comes in and he says, he's got my MRI image of my brain on the screen. And he said, there's a big thing in there. It needs to come out. I can do it in two days or two weeks. What do you want? <laughs> and he said, um, I've got to go talk to my scheduler person. I'll be back in a couple minutes. Let me know if you want to do surgery in two days. <laughs> and as you can imagine, I was in shock, I was overwhelmed, I was terrified of someone taking a saw to my head. I didn't know if we should get a second opinion. I didn't know what we should do. And Jenny, as we're sitting there uh, in the surgeon's office without the surgeon, Jenny sent a text to Peter. And I had just that week kind of said I wanted to start going to Peter's, Peter's doctor, Peter's um, clinic as my primary care clinic. And Jenny sent me a text saying, well, when we're here, we don't know what to do. And I was just looking down, panicking. And when I looked up, just moments later, Peter appeared in the chair next to me. <laughs> <laughs> like magic. <laughs> I didn't know doctors could do that. <laughs> And I don't know if we're really supposed to be texting or doctor, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but whenever I still think about Peter showing up so fully, I still cry thinking about how grateful I am. And Peter reassured us that yes, actually doing surgery in two days is good. Soon is good. It's the right thing to do, which I couldn't. I didn't know, I couldn't say on my own. But Peter sat there with us. Dr. Naguib, the surgeon, came back in the, in the room. And we agreed to do surgery in two days. So I spent two days trembling and squeezing Jenny and telling people I knew that I loved them because I didn't know if I would survive the surgery or what my functioning would be after the surgery. And shortly after the surgery, 
I met for the first time Dr. Trusheim. And Dr. Trusheim explained that the biopsy from the surgery showed that it was cancerous and that it was the most aggressive kind of brain cancer, glioblastoma. And Dr. Trusheim was as sensitive and skillful as possible about asking me if and when I wanted to know the statistics about average survival for this diagnosis. And I didn't want to know at first. In the next office visit, when I did finally say, yes, I want to know, Dr. Trusheim drew me a nice graph, curve, that showed, he said, depending on which study you believe, average survival is between 15 and 18 months. I think he said he tended to prefer 18 months. <laughs> I prefer <it> to. <laughs> and I was still overwhelmed and in shock. Jumping back in time, when I was in fifth grade, my family moved when I was in fifth grade from Kentucky to Missouri. And when we moved, shortly after that, I was in the school cafeteria. And I was sitting at a table by myself, and all the other boys in fifth grade were sitting at the next table, talking to each other and eating. And when I was sitting at the table by myself, I was telling myself two stories. The stories were, one, I'm not cool enough, I'm not confident enough, I'm not good enough to be at that table. And at the same time, I was telling myself, well, actually, I'm a little bit better than them because I'm analyzing the situation. <laughs> and I'm, I can see the social dynamics. I can see my own perceptions. That makes me better than them. And those two stories, that I'm not good enough and that I'm better than, have stayed with me for the 40 plus years since that time, or 35 plus years since that time in fifth grade. But when Dr. Trusheim told me about the brain cancer, I knew that I needed to live and learn different stories. And I quickly got help from that, from, among others, Emily Jarrett Hughes, who happens to be sitting right there too. <laughs> that the same week that I had that brain surgery, Emily and my sister from England and her family, they organized a party to support my healing. That was kind of a combination of a talent show <laughs> and a prayer service and kind of like a memorial service for me that I could go to, which is kind of cool. I mean, I reckon that. And as my friends were at that event, standing around me and my family, singing to us, laying their hands on me, praying for me, for the first time, I started to tell some of my story of what it's like to be on that roller coaster of brain cancer. That I told them how magic Peter was. Peter was actually there, I believe. And I told them about how freaked out I was when Dr. Trusheim said 15 to 18 months. And as they were listening to me, as you are now, it felt like they were reaching into my belly and shifting it. That I, ever since finding out about that brain tumor, was panicked with my belly in knots and grasping for what do I need to do to live as long as possible? I don't, especially, I don't want to leave my two kids before they finish growing up. So I was grasping with my belly being tight. And when I told, started to tell my story to these friends, it felt like they 
did, I don't know how they did it, something to open up my belly and soften it and help me realize that what's most important to me isn't the number of days that I live, but it's the degree to which I can take in the love that's being offered to me and let it move through me. And ever since then, that's happened over and over again, that the more I'm able to honestly and openly share what it's like for me to go through this roller coaster and that I receive people's listening and love shifts my belly from the panic to receiving love. Which is my understanding of the, the foundation of healing is that shift from panic to receiving love. So after the surgery, when I met with Dr. Trusheim, he, um, he explained that the normal, normal treatment for this diagnosis is quite standard, I believe, is that you do chemo, an oral chemo, and you do radiation in the spot of the tumor. Because they've taken out um, a tumor about the size of a ping pong, um, but the kind of cancer it is, it tends to mm, what, burrow and spread around. So it, you can't say, we got it all. You have to do extra stuff. So I started doing chemo and radiation. And when I started that, I have an aunt who lives in Indiana, Aunt Marcia. Maybe Aunt Marcia's watching. Um, and Marcia said, she said she, she felt inspired to every day when I was doing chemo, send me stories. Stories of other people in our family who experienced challenges and found grace in those challenges. And one story she told me was about my great grandmother, who I met and really appreciated when she was alive, but I didn't, I'd never heard this story from her. My great grandmother had a daughter named Mary Esther. And when Mary Esther was a toddler, she was very sick. She took her to the doctor. It was an obstructed bowel. And the doctor said, I can't do anything for her. My great grandmother was at home making dinner. And Mary Esther came over and tugged on her apron and said, Mama, can you rock me? My great grandmother picked up Mary Esther. She rocked her, she sang to her, and Mary Esther died in her arms. So Marcia's telling me this story, and she adds to that that when my great grandmother was dying, Marcia was there next to her and asked her, could she hold her the way she did for her daughter when she died? And Marcia said that was one of the most euphoric things in her life. And my great grandmother and Mary Esther and Marcia started teaching me that healing and dying sometimes go together. They're not enemies. So a few months went by. <clears throat> I was doing the chemo, finished the radiation. And I went in for a regular MRI of my brain, which I had and still do on a regular basis. And I walked in to Dr. Trusheim's office and I asked him, how does the MRI look? And Dr. Trusheim said very calmly, could be better. And he then explained that in the area where the tumor was taken out, there had been growth again. And he was pretty certain it was cancerous. And in the days following that time, I again felt panic, confused and overwhelmed. And this time I felt angry. I felt angry this was happening. And also, I felt angry at Dr. Trusheim. I wanted different information and I wanted, 
I wanted to feel more power to figure this out. I didn't feel power and I didn't feel trust and partnership with Dr. Trusheim. I felt lonely. And my wife and I, in the next few days, we scrambled and researched options and found a clinical trial that was available through Dr. Trusheim's office and hospital. And right before I had a second surgery, the clinical trial, thanks to Dr. Trusheim and others, got put in place. But it was a very stressful couple days. And after that sur surgery, shortly after I got out of the hospital, I wrote a letter to Dr. Trusheim. And I knew that I needed to tell my story in a new way because if I was going to feel trust and partnership with Dr. Trusheim and with other doctors and people, I needed to take responsibility for that as much as anybody. And honestly, at that time, I, I wanted another oncologist. And I did meet with another oncologist. But when I thought about it and prayed about it, I wanted to more intentionally choose Dr. Trusheim as a partner in healing. And I knew very likely a partner in my dying. And Dr. Trusheim and his staff generously received that input. And a few months went by, and again, I started to feel like, okay, it's maybe going to get kind of normal. But then again, I started to get intense headaches. And I went to the emergency room and eventually found out that I had meningitis infection in my spinal fluid, which I also knew could quickly kill you, like the brain cancer can. And then I was in the hospital several days with meningitis. After one test, my spinal fluid came back, I talked to Peter, and he said, no, this is serious, you have to go. You have to go to the hospital to get on serious antibiotics. And that time I was in the hospital, <clears throat> there were several doctors then working with me, including an infectious disease doctor, Dr. Trisha and Peter and others. And at that time, they didn't all agree on what to do with me. As I understand it, the infectious disease doctor said, you're going to need to have another surgery to take out the titanium, the screw that's in my skull from the previous surgery. He thought the infection was caused by that screw and it wouldn't go away until that happened, until it was taken out, which would mean there'd be a big soft spot in my head forever. But I believe Dr. Trusheim and my surgeon were cautious about maybe that's not a good idea. And I felt confused and overwhelmed and afraid of dying from meningitis or cancer and wasn't sure which one. Just a race between those two in the hospital. And in the hospital that time, there was a woman who came in to clean my room. His name is Pema. And as Pema was taking out the trash, she did a story intervention on me. She told me a story about her son, who had a serious kind of cancer also, and how she took him to a monastery and how he got better. And she looked at me. She knew I was freaked out. She looked at me and she said, with authority, she said, doctors and prayer can work together. And she gave me a kind of peace and comfort that doctors weren't able to at that time. And a couple of months went by of being on antibiotics. And it was a little bit unclear if and when I should go off the antibiotics. 
But in talking to Peter and Dr. Trusine, I decided to go off the antibiotics. And Pema was right. The doctors in prayer worked together, and the meningitis went away without the surgery. This past winter, Dr. Trusheim did a story intervention on me, which he might not have thought of as such. <laughs> but I had gone in for a regular MRI and went into the clinic and to see what the results were. And Dr. Trusheim said, well, it's stable, just like it's been the last year now. And Dr. Trusheim, as I remember it, said, you can start imagining life beyond the next two months when the next MRI is. You can expand how you see life. And I think Dr. Trusheim saw that I was living in a story that was afraid to imagine anything possible beyond when I do my next MRI in two or three months. And he was inviting me to live in a bigger story, to imagine life beyond those two months. And I'm very grateful for Dr. Trishheim's willingness to walk with me in the unique, unpredictable path of my brain cancer, which I'm guessing for most patients does not involve what we're doing right now. <laughs> this is the third one this week. The third one. <laughs> it's quite a sport. Well, and in fact, when I asked Dr. Trishheim to do this, he said, he said yes, and that he would be Keith Richards playing riffs. I think he's got his guitar in there, and I could be Mick Jagger up here dancing around. <laughs> Is that a good sport or what? <laughs> so I love that willingness to be with me in the unique unfolding of my journey. But one of my favorite authors, John O'Donohue, my friend Peter's helped me get to know. John O'Donohue says, I would love to live like a river flows, carried by the surprise of its own unfolding. And that's my understanding of the healing power of stories, that a good story unfolds the next image, the next emotion, the next action in a way that always keeps us guessing and wondering what's next without jumping to the conclusion and just saying the conclusion, but living and feeling the next step one at a time with curiosity. I was talking recently with Mary Jo Kreitzer, who is a leader both nas nationally and locally in studying and defining what healing is. We were talking about how there's not a lot of common scientific definition and study about healing. And Mary Jo says, <clears throat> but one thing you can say is you can say healing is possible. And I found that helpful and what I want to say from my experience is that healing is not only possible, but it's possible at times when death seems imminent or isolation seems permanent. And I want to add, have the audacity to add to Mary Jo's statement that healing is inevitable and unavoidable. It just probably won't look like we thought it would. There's another story that my Aunt Marsha told me when I was doing chemo about my great Aunt Ruby. She's quite a character who I also knew and appreciated. And when Ruby was dying, she was quite isolated. Her husband had died. She didn't have any children. She didn't really have any friends. And my Aunt Marsha was taking care of her as she was dying. And in that time before death, when people tend to kind of come in and out of consciousness, when Ruby would wake up, she would often say, it's, it's amazing, it's unbelievable. And one time when she woke up, she said, I had it wrong. Life is about love. And she was dazzled and amazed by how she was being inundated with that love as she was dying, even though 
She had been mean to her caregivers and driven many of them away, and was in an isolated condition. She was overwhelmed by healing and love. When I was doing chemo, it was also time I was having dinner with my family, and I had told my kids a lot of times I was quite naggy about wash your hands, don't stick your fingers in the chips, and I was afraid of dying from germs because my white blood cell count was low. And one time at dinner, I said to my family, I said I feel lonely. And sad about nagging you so much about washing your hands, and and one of my kids had just double dipped his carrot in the hummus, <laughs> and I had snapped at him about double dipping could kill me or something like that. <laughs> and then I told my two kids and my wife I felt lonely and sad about nagging them so much, and my daughter replied, "Yeah, Dad, but you tell us that all the time, and you don't need to." It's, and I felt more lonely and sad. <laughs> And after dinner, I was, I was in my bedroom, feeling lonely and sad. And I overheard my kids talking to each other, preteen and teen. And my son was telling my daughter something to the effect of, "I think Dad was trying to get us. He was trying to help us understand what it's like for him, and maybe we could, we could be more supportive of him." And they didn't know I was listening to this. But when I heard that, I started crying about how supported I felt, how much I love my son who said that.、And、then my son walked past the door. He's 14 at this point. He walked past my bedroom door and he said, "Hi, Dad. What you doing?" I said,、uh, "I'm crying about how much I love you." <laughs> <laughs> and I was pretty sure, as a 14-year-old boy, or most people. He would run really quickly away, <laughs> but he didn't run away. Instead, he came into my room. He climbed on my bed with me, and he grabbed my hands, and he looked into my eyes, which, of course, totally lost it then. <laughs> I'm just slobbering on him, and、uh, after you know a minute or so, I. I let go of his hands because I didn't want to torture him with my tears. But when I let go of his hand, he grabbed tighter. And then about then, my daughter walked by my room, and I said to her before she asked what we're doing, I said, "Hey, Grace. Oops, I said her name. <laughs> can you come in? Here, come in here so I can." Cry about how much I love you. <laughs> She cooperated. <laughs> I squeezed her hand to cry about how much I loved her. And my wife came in. I cried over her. And I believe Ruby, my aunt, my great aunt, was right that that love. It's unavoidable, and I'm very grateful for my kids and others who keep teaching me how to receive it, because that, to me, is the foundation of all healing: receiving love. And the medical treatment can make that possible and complement that in really important ways. And in this、mm, practice of healing stories, I think, like with all treatments. There can be dangerous side effects. I think the most dangerous side effect that I know about is if I take my story too seriously, or think it's the only truth. And the best antidote that I know about to that side effect is to open up to other people's stories of what's painful for them and what's healing in them. And I know that there are others of you here today who also are facing aggressive cancer. And I know there are others of you here today 
who long to be present and supportive to your kids in ways you're afraid you can't. And I know there are those of you here deeply grieving loved ones who have recently gone away. I have a friend, Barbara McAfee, who also is sitting right here. Wow. <laughs> and when Barbara sings, I often feel this spiritual power wash over me and envelop me like a healing river. And right now, I would like to invite, remind you of those yellow cards I asked you about at the beginning, and invite any of you who want to acknowledge silently healing that you long for, physically, emotionally, in relationship. If you'd like to acknowledge that and receive that healing river, to silently stand up, just wave your hands, and in a minute, I'm going to invite Barbara to come up and sing to us as we imagine that healing river washing over us. So please join me in standing if you'd like to. And Barbara, please sing to us. This is a song by Moira Smiley, and I sing it frequently to the Mississippi River where Michael and I linger quite often. Come and stand in that river, current gentle and slow. Send your troubles down water. When you stand in that river, angels say in your head secrets beyond every worry, dreams beyond every dread. Tell me, brother, tell me, sister, where? Oh, flows down to the great wall. 